Hi, welcome everyone. This is Heidi, the Education Manager at Bluff Lake Nature Center. And today I'm excited to be here with George Ho. He is an avid birder and photographer who's been very active at Bluff Lake for the last few years. And he's gonna be telling us about rare and elusive birds that have been spotted in this area. So before he gets going, I wanna give a little bit of background about the Aquatic Habitat Improvement Project, popularly called the Lake Project here at Bluff Lake. So Bluff Lake is eight acres and it's the cornerstone of the larger 123 acre property. And in the past, it didn't use the whole water year round. The dam was 120 years old. So water leached through it fairly easily over to Sand Creek. And in the summer when water was more scarce, the lake didn't hold water, which meant we didn't have a consistent aquatic habitat. So in 2016, we reinforced that dam, dredged the bottom of the lake, and created a new water source that was deeper and more consistent. The results have been really great. We've seen 50 new bird species since this was done. So we're really fortunate to have this and very grateful to the many donors, grants, stakeholders, staff, and board who were really important in making this come about. So with that being said, I'd like to turn things over to George. Hello, uh, I'm uh, very excited and happy uh, to be doing this uh, presentation on rare and elusive birds in and around the Buff Lake Nature Center. Uh, as Heidi uh, pointed out, the Lake Project uh, has uh, repaired the previous uh, dam leak and has improved the habitat so that we are seeing uh, many more birds uh, because of the uh, improvement in the uh, environment. Uh, my presentation will include some of the uh, results of that, the birds uh, that have uh, been spotted uh, that had not been seen before. And also um, I will show you photos of uh, some of the uh, rarer and uncommon birds uh, around Buff Lake Nature Center. Uh, all the slides that you will see are photos taken by me, uh, cropped and modified by me and the dates and locations are indicated. Um, and uh, I just wanted to, to also acknowledge that as I uh, go along this presentation, I will be mentioning uh, folks who are birders who initially identified uh, and reported the birds to give them credit for the sightings. Uh, I may not be 100% accurate, and I will apologize ahead of time if I um, omit, uh, make some mistakes or oversight, but uh, it is uh, my best attempt in making this as accurate as possible. I will uh, begin by presenting uh, 10 uh, such birds, and by definition, the rare birds would be birds that had not been seen here before all birds that are seen very infrequently. In other words, uh, several years uh, will go by before the birds are seen again. The uncommon ones are ones that maybe you skip a year or two uh, in between sightings. And then the elusive uh, birds are uh, usually not uncommon birds, but they are hard to uh, identify or see because they're so elusive and shy. Uh, but these photos will show you uh, a nice illustration of what these birds look like. I will start uh, alphabetically, uh, starting with the American bittern. This is the American bittern and this position of the bird with his neck extended, head looking up in the sky with the eyes up here. Uh, this is the typical behavior of this bird when it is uh, disturbed or threatened, it will hold this position uh, without any motion so that it's well camouflaged against the background of cattails. This is a heron. It was first uh, uh, alerted to, to me by Marty Richardson, one of the regular birders. 
Uh, it was reported on eBird first by uh, Andrew Fontenot, who is a uh, pulmonary critical care physician at Anschutz. As you will see as the presentation goes on, he often is the first one to identify some of these uncommon and rare birds. Uh, this uh, heron uh, is not all that uncommon, but it is elusive and hard to identify. This bird was only present for one day, and some of us uh, are lucky enough uh, to see it thanks to uh, Marty Strickland alerting me to its presence. So George, I noticed that it seems that you know most of the birders at Bluff Lake quite well. Could you talk a little bit more about how this birding community that you've helped develop here enhances the experience for everyone who's interested in the hobby? Uh, yes, I uh, took over this uh, task uh, or job, if you will, uh, from uh, Fran. Uh, Fran Haas had been leading this uh, monthly first Saturday uh, bird walk for quite a few years. I don't know when it all started, but I started uh, to take over uh, this task about uh, two or three years ago with the help of uh, two other uh, regulars, uh, Peter Conrad and uh, Steve Hebert, who helped uh, lead these groups. Um, our group, I believe, has grown. Um, and I currently uh, keep uh, a list, uh, an email list that I notify everybody who's interested to be notified and alert them to uh, the first uh, Saturday of each month to join us in the parking lot. We go from 8 to 10 o'clock. So uh, I, I think um, the number of birders visiting Buff Lake uh, uh, has increased over time. I cannot give you the hard data on that. And I think that also uh, explains why we are seeing uh, more of the uncommon and rare birds. More people being vigilant to help spot them. Absolutely. Okay. And some of these names that I'm throwing around are people who are obviously regular birders, and some of them I know personally, others I know their name from eBird checklists. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I do want to give them credit for these sightings, uh, whatever that data is available. I'm sure they appreciate that. Yeah. So I'll make sure to post information for anyone who's interested about how to become involved in this birding group. Yes. It is open and free. So they can either just show up for one, the first one they're interested in, yes. or email you to get added to that email list. Right, and I, I think uh, uh, some people have found this program uh, on the website. Uh, all by word of mouth. Great. So uh, the next bird is truly a rare bird. It is the Brant, uh, Brant goose. Uh, this um, small goose uh, was sighted by Mary Kay on February 27th, swimming in Buff Lake with uh, Canada geese. Uh, she posted it with a photo, photo, uh, photograph, and uh, the next day, many of us went to look for this uh, rare bird uh, that actually nests in the Arctic and is uh, almost uh, not seen within the continental U.S. in the central part of the country and certainly not in Denver. It is uh, brown and black with a white tail and it has the field mark of this white ring around the neck. This particular bird has an injured right leg or foot, but uh, the bird was able to swim without any difficulty and fly without any difficulty. It was uh, seen uh, just um, the two days, um, the 27th and the 28th of February, and, and then lost to follow up. Um, what do you think he might have been doing around here? Well, um, 
obviously blown off course uh, because this bird <laughs> should should be um, seen on uh, the East Coast more often than the West Coast, but almost uh, never in the center part of the US. Moving on to the next bird. Uh, this is a flycatcher. Uh, the grave flycatcher, and I'll take credit for uh, spotting and photographing this bird uh, September 6th, uh, two years ago, uh, 2018. Uh, you will uh, see three flycatchers during this presentation. This is the first one. It is, uh, it is called gray flycatcher, and you know the reason why, because it's mostly gray. Like, uh, uh, most flycatchers, uh, gray is the predominant color with some white, some yellow tinge, and maybe some olive color. And the other terms that you will see used with the gray fly, uh, with the flycatchers are the eye ring, uh, which can be present, can be bowed, or can be absent. The wing bars, which are, uh, which you see here, they're almost always two. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about the behavior of this bird when it's hunting for insects uh, with one of the later flycatchers. But this one is quite rare in this part uh, of the country. Um, and one of the unique features about this bird is that it flicks its tail downwards uh, instead of upwards, uh, which is one of the field marks where you can tell them apart. The flycatchers are notoriously difficult to separate uh, by accurate identification. People with good ears and experience uh, will often uh, tell you that they can positively ID the bird by its song or calls rather than by its appearance. And this will be apparent when I show you the other flycatchers. So how does the process work for verifying these rare sightings? Could you talk a little bit more about who determines if it's rare and who helps substantiate these sightings? Uh, eBird, which is the uh, uh, web-based uh, citizen science site that birders can report their checklist to, uh, is run by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Uh, one of the leaders in uh, uh, research and education on birds. And um, on the checklist that we use to report this to uh, Cornell, uh, it will indicate this is a infrequent species, a rare species or whatever. So when you report it, they will ask you for specific details as far as what you saw that make you identify this bird as uh, this particular species. And they will verify it. If you have a photo, it helps them a great deal. Once they confirm that they will post it officially. Uh, and some of us um, would uh, subscribe to an eBird rare, rare bird uh, alert list, which comes once a day when uh, uh, rare birds are reported, you, I will get an email from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology that this bird was seen, its location, by whom, and uh, some birders will go and chase and look for it. That's something I've been wondering is, I know when there's a rare bird, there's a lot of excitement, a lot of stir that I'm hearing, not only from birders in the group, but outside. Yes. So I was wondering what this communication method was to tell everybody, hurry over to Central Park and try to find the Brant goose before yes. it moves on. There, there are some crazy birders who uh, would chase down a bird at all costs. <laughs> um, I uh, am not one of those, <laughs> but uh, there's a whole spectrum of us. Got it, daily email blasts. Right. And I will be sure to post the link for the Bluff Lake hotspot for eBird in case anyone wants to check that out. Yes. Um, you can sort it by first scene to easily see which birds have most recently been spotted here for the very first time. Right. The information that Cornell Lab of Ornithology provide is very extensive and very helpful. Moving on to the next bird. Um, it is the green uh, heron. Uh, as you can see from the date, uh, it was uh, the summer, uh, two summers ago. This uh, green heron was first reported by John Cobb on June 20th, 
2018. It is a heron. It is a little bit smaller than the black crowned night heron, but it's uh, a lot more colorful. It is a rare bird uh, to see in Denver. Uh, it is a year round resident of Florida. And as you can see from the photos, uh, the birds, the colors in the shade and in the sunlight are quite different. It is a very colorful bird. I believe the green uh, in its name comes from the color on its crown and maybe on the back. Uh, it has this um, rust color on the side. And then the breast has white streaks. And this is very conspicuous when you see this bird from far off to be able to identify it um, as a, a green heron as opposed to the more common black crowned night heron that we see here. This bird uh, hung around uh, the entire summer, uh, feeding off the rich, the rich. Uh, source of uh, food uh, uh, on the uh, northern, uh, mainly on the northern shore of uh, Buff Lake. Uh, it is pretty. Uh, it stayed until mid-September and then uh, it uh, went on its way. So um, quite a few people uh, saw this bird, both local and from uh, elsewhere. Right, and I'm assuming in that left photo there is one of his legs is kind of tucked up under his body. This is a typical position that birds assume when they are standing still and resting. The brain of the birds uh, allow them to have very good balance. And uh, in this position, they are conserving energy and resting. Uh, humans would find this a very difficult task to do. But for birds, it's easy and they use it to rest. This is truly a rare bird, the groove billed Ani. Uh, it was uh, spotted and first reported by Jason Bidgood. Uh, he is uh, uh, one of our regular. Uh, birders uh, who also photograph birds. It is all black with a long tail and its name is derived from the groove that in this huge beak. This is a tropical bird that shouldn't be in Denver. And from the date, uh, maybe some of you will recall, it was like a week or two after um, a hurricane. So we were wondering if this bird was uh, blown off course by this uh, massive uh, weather disturbance. Anyway, this bird was uh, seen here um, for about two weeks. Uh, it was never actually on the grounds of Bluff Lake Nature Center. However, uh, it uh, was uh, basically uh, hanging around uh, west of Buff Lake along the Sand Creek Greenway, mainly between where Westerly Creek joins the Sand Creek and west to the Smith Road Bridge. Many people uh, had come to uh, see this bird and uh, he or she did not uh, disappoint by uh, showing up and entertaining uh, many birders along the shore of uh, Sand Creek. Uh, it turns out that this bird uh, is uh, a year-round resident of Costa Rica, and uh, I was in Costa Rica in March of 2019 and had photographed several of these birds on a lawn. I misidentified it as the common grackle. Uh, I went back, looked at my photos, corrected it on eBird list, and uh, I suspect that this bird may have followed me back to Costa Rica. <laughs> To, uh, to Denver. You wanted to make uh, sure you found out what he really was. Um, well, I, I went back and looked at it uh, and close up on the beak and the beak is unique for uh, this bird. That is something uh, I wanted to ask you about. So it looks like it might be specialized to a different kind of diet. What it, is it that they- It very well may be. The, the size of the beak, the shape of the beak uh, will often, uh, determine what kind of uh, fruit, nuts, or uh, vegetation that it eats. And I, I suspect um, it's, uh, it's an evolutionary process. The, the question is uh, 
always raise as to which came first, the, the shape and size of the beak or the food that the, the bird feeds on. And I suspect evolution works the way uh, that uh, uh, supply and demand that the bird will adapt to the available food. Great. Moving right along, uh, this is the Harris's uh, sparrow. It is an uncommon sparrow to see in uh, Denver. It is uh, unique in the sense that this is the only sparrow that only breeds in Canada and nowhere, el nowhere else in the world. Uh, this bird uh, was seen uh, at uh, Buff Lake. Um, by uh, myself, uh, both in uh, October, November of 2018, and then May of 2019. And it was seen in the company of uh, white crowned uh, sparrows. Uh, it, uh, as I said, it breeds in Canada, nowhere else uh, in the world. In the winter, it settles in the South Central Great Plains, east of Colorado. Uh, as you can see, the, uh, the time that I saw this bird before uh, 2018 uh, is uh, in May of 2011. So quite a few years have gone by before I uh, was lucky enough to see the bird again. And th the pictures here are taken of the bird in 2011 at the Rocky Mountain Arsenal National Wildlife uh, Refuge. Uh, it causes quite a bit of excitement when it's reported that bird is like to go take a look at this fairly large uh, sparrow that has a black head and a, a neck and a, a light colored yellow bill. This is a, a beautiful bird. Uh, it is the red-headed uh, woodpecker. And you can't miss this bird. It's the only woodpecker whose head is entirely red and the rest of the body is black and white. Whether it's in flight or perched on a tree, uh, it is uh, very noticeable. And this bird uh, is uh, also uh, quite rare. It is more common in the eastern half of the US and is very rarely seen west of the Rockies. Um, as you can see from this photo with the dates of uh, uh, 2016 and 2019, three years go by before I saw the bird uh, again. Uh, and more recently, as recently as a couple of weeks ago, uh, a juvenile red-headed woodpecker was reported on the west side of Rocky Mountain Arsenal along First Creek. And when I saw that report on eBird, I was pretty excited and went out there and was uh, uh, privileged to be able to spot this juvenile red-headed woodpecker. And as you can see, it has the shape of the woodpecker. It's black and white. It, it's got uh, spots on the breast as many juvenile birds have to camouflage them. And then its head has not turned red. It will be one year old before its head turns uh, red. This is gray. So this is a juvenile red-headed woodpecker seen on September 20th, 2020. So that must be hard to ID the juveniles since the coloring isn't there. What yes. are people mostly looking at the, the shape or if they're spotted near an adult or how do people? Experience. <laughs> Experience and knowing that the juveniles often uh, look quite different uh, as far as the coloration. Uh, and uh, once you've uh, seen a juvenile and are looking for it, then it becomes uh, much more obvious. Cool. That one isn't as obviously woodpecker looking like the woody woodpecker, redheaded. <laughs> Correct. But the position, it, you know, how it's hanging on to this telephone pole and is uh, perched on the tip of the snag are typical of woodpe woodpeckers. And they are uh, vertical. Yeah, position. So now we come to the not so uncommon birds, but the elusive and uh, secretive ones. And the two birds that I will show you here are rails. Uh, the first one is uh, Sora. 
it's a, a chicken-like bird, uh, and it is uh, dashing in and out of the cattails, as you can see the photos here. Uh, it is uh, a marsh bird in the sense that it uh, tends to be next to water. Uh, and it will come out of the uh, cattails to feed, and then at any disturbance or threat, the bird will just dash right back into the uh, cattails. And that's why uh, it is often heard rather than seen. Uh, the Sora is one of the two rails I'll show you, and this is this bird. The other uh, rail that I'll show you is called Virginia rail. Uh, it is uh, similar. And uh, before I show you the Virginia rail, uh, I will uh, play a recording of the calls and the song of the Sora so that if you are near uh, the proper uh, habitat of uh, water and cattails and you hear this, then uh, you should be uh, uh, spending a little bit of time to look for it and to see if you can catch it. This uh, uh, rail, uh, the Sora has a shorter beak than the Virginia uh, rail that I will uh, show you uh, next. Uh, but here uh, I'm going to uh, play you the typical call of a Sora. If you hear this, you need to be uh, looking for this bird. And this is uh, the other. Possible uh, call or song that you may hear from uh, this bird. You said that one's less common, is that correct? Uh, in my experience, the, the first example that I uh, uh, showed you uh, here is, is more common. For, the, for this bird. So uh, moving right along to the next uh, uh, rail, and this is a Virginia rail, and you can see that the uh, brown and black uh, color are similar, but it has a much uh, longer beak. And the uh, habitat that it's in is uh, also very similar. They, they never stray very far from the cattail so they could dash and, and hide and they feed on insects and vegetation uh, in, the, uh, in the water. Um, both of these birds uh, have uh, uh, chicks that start out black. Uh, this is a, a juvenile Virginia rail also at Buff Lake. And you can see that the color is much darker before it, uh, 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 it develops the adult coloration. And this is a, a pic, two pictures of a Sora chick, uh, which uh, when it's younger, it's all black, but you can see this bird is already developing some of the adult coloration and the beak is short and makes it a, a Sora rather than a Virginia rail. Do you think that the chicks are easier to spot or harder to spot? Have they not yet developed their full adult caution? Are they a little reckless? Or are they kind of even more elusive? Yeah, well, juvenile birds are usually uh, more approachable be because as you say, they're not experienced and they're not uh, frightened of uh, humans. They don't quite appreciate the threat uh, which they learn as they grow older. Uh, but uh, these elusive birds, uh, they're really very skittish and shy, and the uh, chicks would uh, dash in and out just like the parents. Okay, so now we're coming to the 10th bird uh, on that list that I uh, started with, and that's uh, our wild turkey. I have to give uh, credit for the first spotting of this bird, again, to Andrew Fontenot, the pulmonologist at Anschutz. He first reported on eBird in July 14th of 2017 of this uh, wild turkey hen. 
And uh, she has been spotted ever since uh, over the last three Thanksgivings. Um, and uh, the photos will show you um, that the last time I saw and photographed uh, this bird uh, who has been named Gertrude. And if you're wondering how that name uh, came along, we have uh, Rachel to thank uh, for this name because after this bird had been sighted by many people, um, we decided to uh, have a name the wild turkey hen contest and Gertrude was the uh, unanimous uh, name that we came up with. So Gertrude was last seen by me on March 20th, uh, 2020. As you can see, it, so it was after a snowstorm and here she is uh, running around. Uh, she has been absent from uh, Buff Lake Nature Center for periods of uh, two or three months, uh, in, you know, after the uh, winter in the spring. Uh, these uh, birds are not migratory, so they don't go south as far as I know. Maybe she just went into a neighborhood different from us and we're uh, looking forward to her return to uh, Buff Lake. So we come to our intermission here. Uh, so that the uh, time allows, we'll continue and do uh, 10 more birds. Okay. Okay, so uh, we've done uh, 10 birds. Uh, some of them are rare uh, and some are uncommon and a few are relatively uh, common but elusive. Uh, now uh, time does allow us to go ahead with uh, uh, 10 more uh, birds. Uh, and uh, Heidi, you had asked about uh, some of these uh, birds uh, have been seen as recently as during the month of September. And um, that's indeed correct. The last four birds of the 10 that I'll show you have all been sighted uh, during the month of uh, September. Uh, it turns out from my review of the data that um, um, May and September are good months to uh, watch for rare migratory birds. Uh, May for the spring migration north and September for the fall migration south. So we'll go on uh, with the first bird in the second group is the black-headed uh, grosby. As you can see, the dates uh, of 2019 and 2012 is the separation of the male and female black-headed grosbeak uh, that I've been able to see and photograph. Um, the In between those two dates, I was fortunate to uh, see and photograph this female black-headed grosbeak at the uh, Rocky Mountain Arsenal uh, in uh, August of 2017. Uh, as you can see from these photos, the male and the female uh, look very different, usually uh, these are both females, but the uh, previous picture shows the male and the female quite different. Usually the male is uh, more colorful uh, and, and the female uh, less so. Uh, and it does uh, take a little practice to be able to recognize the different sexes to identify the bird accurately. Um, Moving on to the next uh, bird, uh, I want to talk a little bit about egrets and specifically the cattle egret, which you see here and here. Uh, these pictures show the cattle egret with the snowy egret. The snowy egret is the ubiquitous uh, egret here. The snowy egret is the uncommon one. Here are the two photos of uh, egret, cattle egret showing the uh, uh, light color uh, bill uh, and the uh, uh, legs. Uh, the yellow bill and the yellow uh, legs are characteristic of the uh, uh, cattle egret. The snowy egret uh, is, as I said, the more ubiquitous uh, bird here in the summer months. And the great egret is a, a majestic looking bird that is um, uh, 
twice the size of a cattle egret as these uh, photos uh, show you. And the big distinction between the uh, snowy egret and the great egret are the color of the beak and the feet. The um, great egret has a yellow beak and black feet, whereas uh, the snowy egret has a black beak and yellow feet, as the previous uh, pictures have shown. So I was kind of wading through all these different beak and feet colors. So would it be accurate to say, first, if you look at the beak and it's black, you know it's a snow egret. Correct. And then if it's yellow, it could be either a cattle egret or a great egret. Correct. So at that point, you're looking at size. And the big one's the great egret. Correct. And the, and the legs of the cattle egret is also yellow during the... Uh, uh, mating or breeding season, uh, whereas it can uh, turn dark uh, during the uh, non-breeding season. So um, I think you bring up a good point. The, the initial impression of um, identifying a bird is to recognize the shape and to put it in the right category. Uh, any birder seeing one of these birds with the long neck in the water will uh, immediately identify it as an egret. And then you sort through the different egrets, uh, snowy being the most common, uh, cattle being quite uncommon. And the great egret, of course, you can distinguish, distinguish it from the size. But when you see the birds alone, you don't have the larger or the smaller bird for comparison. And the other nice thing about the great egret um, to know is that it um, it looks, uh, it's just a little bit smaller than the great blue uh, heron. Uh, in fact, uh, I have never seen one, but uh, it is known that the great blue heron has a white morph, which uh, makes it look very much like the great egret. And so, um, can you talk a little bit about what a morph is? Morph uh, is, is just a, a different uh, uh, coloration of the same bird. So it's kind of like a less commonly seen version. Yeah, it, it, there can be regional variation in the intensity of the color or the actual color. So um, like um, with the red-tailed hawk, the most common hawk we have, uh, the dark morph, the light morph, and then uh, we even have an intermediate morph. And uh, those are just the different degrees of brownness in the feathers. I can see why it takes years to become fully experienced because you've got the different morphs, the different sexes, and the different ages, juvenile versus adult, and they're all looking Yes. slightly different for each bird. Yes, absolutely. Those are the challenges, but they're also uh, the fun part of uh, being able to recognize uh, these. Uh, oh, and I forgot the winter plumage too, of course. And actually, I was wondering if we could go back without ruining everything. Yeah. Okay, yes, so, so one of the additional challenges slash fun parts is working with the winter plumage. So this is the same bird at different times of the okay. year. Is that accurate? Uh, you, you are very astute in picking up that December 5th, 2013 and July 10th, 2013 are indeed different seasons. But I fooled you because the <laughs> picture on the left that says December 5th, 2017 is actually from Hawaii. Ah. So this bird but in general, this is yeah, what the bird no, would look like is, in these different seasons. Yes, and the the so-called breeding plumage of the cattle egret is the orange color on the crown here, much more prominent on this bird, and also on the on the chest here. And this, you can just see slight orange here, but this bird is much more obvious. This would be the breeding uh, plumage. The colorful of, uh, one. On the right uh, of the uh, of the cattle egret, and as I indicated before, the the legs are also yellow, like the beak. And if I can uh, move uh, to the next.
next next slide, you you can see the uh, the black beak uh, of the snowy, the yellow beak of the great, and the yellow feet and the black feet of the respective uh, birds here. In addition to the size, which is at least twice uh, the size, the great egret is at least twice the size of the caddo. Uh, egret. So the mating season that's in spring, that's when we'd be expecting the more colorful version of the males? Uh, yeah, the, the, the breeding uh, plumage is usually the most colorful because that's uh, uh, to attract the female. Um, and what months generally? Uh, usually in the spring okay. and summer during the warm months, right? So at, the males at, least, doing, at least in this part of the country. So the male's doing the work of attracting the female and then the female just stays kind of more camouflaged year round. The, 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 female, uh, the female feathers will also molt, which is another concept that we uh, can talk a little bit about. The, the feathers will be replaced because they wear out and uh, what you were referring to earlier as the eclipse plumage is usually after the mating season when the feathers are replaced and the replacement of the feather can occur as quickly as within a couple of weeks to uh, over three or four months depending on the species and so on and so forth. Uh, so it's just a uh, it's just a replacement of the feather. That's what I've been trying to figure out for a while when I've heard you say eclipse plumage. So does that mean the colorful plumage, the regular plumage, or kind of like a transitional period? Which one is the eclipse? The eclipse is the transition. Okay. Uh, yeah. So once a feather grows out, it doesn't change color. It will grow to its full length and remain the same color. So when the color changes, it means new feather had replaced the old feather. Got it. So there's the period where they've got a little bit of both going on. Yes. Okay. And, and depending on the species and depending on the rate of the change. Um, and with uh, with the ducks, sometimes when they uh, uh, replace their plumage within a two week period, during the two weeks, uh, they are unable to fly, so they have to find a safe habitat to uh, avoid predators. Great, I think I finally got that one, thank you. <laughs> okay. So moving on to our uh, next bird, it's the common nighthawk. So this is a not too uncommon bird, as the name indicates, but it is very hard to spot for two reasons. One is because it flies erratically uh, like a bat. And the other reason is it's really most active during dawn and dusk. Uh, here is the common night hawk uh, resting on a branch in the daytime. Uh, this bird, you can uh, see its eyes are closed and it is completely still. It's sleeping uh, and it's well camouflaged. The, this bird catches insects uh, in the air and it maneuvers uh, uh, very well uh, in its flying and the wings are very long. As you can see in this resting picture, the tips of the wings actually uh, covers the tail. It's, um, it's a hard bird to um, see, uh, and, but uh, it is here. Here's the second flycatcher that we uh, uh, will discuss today. This is the uh, least flycatcher. As you can see from the photo, it is a compact bird. Uh, its color is, as I indicated before, uh, gray, white, and uh, it has two wing bars and it has an eye ring. And uh, it also has a, a tint of yellow or olive uh, color. And that's what makes the flycatchers very confusing. Um, this bird, as you can see, some uh, lady is holding it in uh, her hand. And this is uh, at the uh, uh, bird banding station at Bar Lake, uh, where 
missed nets, nets are set out to uh, catch these birds during migration. And this whole project of banding birds is to be able to study them, their habits, their health, their population, and so on. And this is based at the Bar Lake, uh, run by the Bird Conservatory of the Rockies. So those mist nets, those are designed, they're just very thin. They're very designed not light. to hurt the birds. Exactly. And we can talk a little bit about that. But before we go, uh, forget about this bird. This bird was trapped and uh, trained volunteers will untangle him or her from the mist net, put it into a cloth bag and keep it quiet and safe so that it's not uh, hurting itself. And then the bird bander, who is an experienced uh, person, will handle the bird gently, take measurements, um, take a sample of the feather, uh, weigh it, and collect all the necessary information and tag it with a uh, uh, aluminum uh, tag wrapped around the lake and then release the bird and record it, record the bird in a, in a, in a catalog. Uh, the reason I show this bird is um, the difficulty in identifying the flycatcher is such that even with this bird being caught in one's hand to look at, one can't be sure of its identity until they have examined it uh, by um, its weight and measurement to conclude that it is indeed a least flycatcher as opposed to the gray flycatcher or the Hammond's flycatcher or the um, willow flycatcher. There are many different flycatchers. So I don't feel badly that I cannot identify a flycatcher with certainty by just uh, seeing it or photographing it when the experts have to uh, weigh it and so on and so forth. So how common is it that they would recatch a bird that has been banded previously? Because that it, would be the ideal, right? Right. It's common. It, you know, during the season of banding, which is during migration, it's not um, unheard of to catch the same bird that's already been banded because they stay in the same area to feed before migration, to fatten up. Um, and, uh, but the, the, the more interesting aspect of this is that uh, when a banded bird is caught uh, a great distance from the place where it was banded, that way we uh, get insight into its uh, uh, migratory route and time and everything. So there's a, a great deal to be uh, learned from bird banding. And you mentioned that's during their migration season. So again, kind of that May, September is when this bird banding usually takes place. Y yes, yes, that's, uh, that's, and then they also look, examine the breast of the bird to see how much fat reserve it has. Usually uh, at migration, they will uh, uh, eat until they store up fat so that they have the fuel for the migration. Right. And I remember one of the really exciting things about Bluff Lakes Bird Day last year was that this was going on live. So it seems like there are some yes. opportunities for the public to yes. see th things like this. Yes, we had representative for the bird banding group to come to Bluff Lake and set up a station where they uh, do that. I'm hoping that we can attract them back and, and hopefully uh, uh, if our bird population continue to increase that it may attract bird banders to come on a regular basis so that we become, if you will, a hotspot uh, for bird banding. There's much to be learned from that. One thing that struck me when I was watching it was that cloth bag you mentioned. Yes. It's, it's counterintuitive. It, it seems like it'd be scary for the bird to be in there, but as you mentioned, that's actually what's keeping them nice and calm to be enclosed and dark. Correct, and and this is uh, true for um, many wildlife. It's, if you cover their eyes, it uh, takes away the stimulus and the excitement and they remain calm. Uh, I think falcons, falconry people have these blinders on the head to keep the birds uh, calm and quiet. Great. So, um, the next bird is uh, a beautiful red-eyed vireo. 
it's a compact bird. As you can see, it's got gray, black, uh, black line across the eye. It's olive green. And uh, it, it's, as, as you can see here, quite compact. And it's called red eyed because of the red eye. You don't see it well here. It could be because of the photography or it could be a young bird before the eyes turn uh, red. This is a very uncommon bird to be seen around uh, Denver, but this was seen at the uh, Sand Creek Regional Greenway, just um, um, west of um, Buff Lake. Here are the white face ibises. Uh, this, uh, look at the color of this bird, uh, rusty uh, brown, and then uh, the um, uh, bronze color, the iridescent color. Uh, it is a wading bird, uh, as you can see the habitat it um, feeds in. And it has a very long bill that's decurved or bent downwards. Uh, its cousin called the glossy ibis is uh, inhabitant of uh, East Coast, especially uh, Florida. And um, this is uh, the non-breeding uh, plumage uh, during breeding season. This area around the eye turns white uh, thus giving its name of white face ibis. Uh, it's a uh, medium-sized uh, wading bird and uh, its coloration, the uniqueness of the decurve, the bill, uh, is what makes this a, a beautiful looking bird. It's, it's, it's not rare, it's uh, uh, uncommon to be able to get this close to look at this bird. So you said D-curved is when the beak curves down? Yeah, so these beaks can be straight, can be curved up or be curved down. So D-curved is uh, synonymous with curving down. What's the, the word for curving up? I'm putting uh, you on the spot here. Uh, I, I, I just curved. Re curved. <laughs> Pre curved. That's, that's, that's as good a name as any. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, yeah. This one is very tropical looking. Is this one more common in the su southern areas? Well, as I said, its cousin, the glossy uh, ibis, uh, is uh, uh, in uh, Florida. And um, this, yeah, this bird, uh, the, the white face ibis is more in the western part of the U.S. Yeah. Uh, you you had uh, mentioned about the different lengths of the bill, mm -hmm. and I think one practical aspect of birds with different length of the beak is that they can feed at different levels uh, in the mud or the water, so that um, there's a greater variety of uh, insects and and source of food that they don't have to compete for the same. Uh, food at the same uh, level. So that's one simple answer, but uh, how they evolve into decurved or recurved or straight bills is, uh, is a mystery to me. Mm -hmm. Our next bird here is the uh, white-throated uh, sparrow. And I think these are the four, the next four birds are the birds that we saw um, in September of this year. This bird, uh, as you can see from the date, I saw this bird two years ago, and this was photographed at the Rocky Mountain uh, Arsenal. Uh, at first glance, this bird looks like the white crowned sparrow, but on closer inspection, it has a white throat and it has the yellow spot above the eye. Otherwise, it does look like a white uh, crowned sparrow. Uh, this was taken in New York City in uh, March of uh, 2017, and in New York and southern New England, this bird is a year-round resident. Um, and um, uh, this bird was uh, first reported uh, at Buff Lake in uh, May of 2020 by Jake Shorty, and then on the same day was also reported by Andrew 
fun night. Uh, this particular uh, September, I uh, ran into this bird on the 19th of September, uh, just uh, east of uh, Buck Lake. Uh, and you can see its uh, white throat, and then you can see the yellow spot on top of the eye. It's uncommon uh, to say the least. So the next bird seen in uh, September is this bird, the black-throated gray wobbler. Um, I um, did not see this bird on September 5th. Uh, September 5th was our week, uh, our monthly bird walk. And we had uh, over 20 people, so we had to go in two groups. Steve Hebert led one group and I led the other group. Typically, when we have two groups like that for our monthly walk, Steve Hebert and uh, Chris uh, uh, Kerwin would lead the other group and I would lead one group. Well, Steve was lucky enough with his group to see this bird. These photos are uh, from my file. And the, the only time I had seen this bird, as you see from the date here of 2012, is in Taos, New Mexico. Uh, the bird has a black throat, thus the name gray, uh, black throated. It has the two yellow spots in front of the eyes. And this is uh, the uh, verbatim quote from Steve Hebert as he reported it uh, on the email to me. Quote, Graham, Ray, and I saw it and exclaimed, black and white wobbler. And then Leslie Coleman correctly identified it for what it was, the black-throated gray wobbler. Then Kenneth Seuss and Lisa Paris photos uh, were accepted by eBird as a rare sighting. It was fun, exclamation point, <laughs> unquote. So this is the excitement that a birder can experience when they see an unusual or rare bird. It takes a village of several people to witness this, correctly identify it, and thoroughly enjoy. So we have uh, Graham Ray, Leslie Coleman, Steve Haber, Kenneth Sue, Lisa Perra, uh, all regulars on the bird group who uh, correctly identified, captured, documented this bird so that eBird can accept it as a rare bird sighting. So that team effort can extend even beyond small groups to nationwide, worldwide. Yes. Do you think that the community of birders has really helped advance our understanding of birds yes, as a species? Absolutely. And I, I think the, the example of the checklist uh, uh, contributed to eBird for the uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology is an example of how citizen scientists can contribute a tremendous amount of data that uh, otherwise cannot be collected. And from this data, we can uh, crank out information about the, uh, the, the nature and the distribution and all, all the fun things about the different species of birds throughout the world. Wonderful. And yeah. I wanted to point out, again, people can check eBird directly, or we do have a pamphlet, if you want to hold that up, George, um, that Rachel Crouch made and updates periodically that shows a list of all the birds that have been spotted at Bluff Lake. Yes, so this and, is, and oh, Rachel, Rachel has uh, done a wonderful job and put asterisks of birds that are new. And the latest edition of this is from the summer of 2020. And there are copies of this that you can pick up at the uh, uh, kiosks at uh, Buff Lake Center. Um, Okay, so the, the, the third bird that we saw in September is the red nape sapsucker. And this is actually a photograph of the bird that a bunch of us saw uh, the next day uh, after uh, Art Hudak reported its presence uh, at the uh, 
of Lake Nature Center. And these photos are from my file taken at Golden Gate Canyon State Park. And as you can see, this is a um, aspen um, tree trunk with a, a, a tree hole nest drilled by the sapsucker. And this sapsucker is labeled as a keystone species, keystone species uh, defining birds that, um, for, uh, that uh, create habitats and source of food for other birds and other animals uh, contributing to the uh, welfare of the ecology. So what this bird does is that it will, it will uh, drill uh, holes uh, for nesting and in the summertime, in addition to using them themselves, as you can see this couple flying in and out feeding the young, uh, other birds in the same area, mountain bluebirds, house wrens, and uh, different sparrows that use tree nests will use the same nests and also the sapsucker will drill holes in trees to let the sap run and the sap uh, feeds other birds and animals in addition to the red nape sapsucker. Keystone species is what- So they're uh, like they're... a building block for the entire ecosystem basically. Right. And right. with those nests, is it correct? They only really need it when they're raising the young. So spring and summer and the rest of the year, they kind of don't necessarily have a home base like that. Yes, in the rest of the year, they're unoccupied with the full rent sign out. <laughs> but they'll return to that same tree year after year. They, they may, and other birds may use it. Mm -hmm. So it's in one breeding season, several species of birds may use the same nest. Right. And do you think they drilled that entire hole or did they maybe find something that was already naturally a little no, open? They, they actually are able to identify trees uh, that uh, are uh, susceptible uh, or easy to drill holes and they will go work on it from scratch and create this uh, nice round hole wow. and uh, evacuate the inside. So finally, we come to our last uh, bird, which is uh, the third flycatcher. This is a very rare bird for this part of the country, the vermilion flycatcher. <laughs> it was uh, spotted on September 21st by Pat Driscoll and uh, Maggie Brown, and many other people have uh, seen it. I uh, went out that afternoon and took these pictures. Uh, it is like the other flycatchers, uh, gray, still two wing bars, uh, with or without eye ring. And this bird, as you can see from this vantage point from the back, it looks like a says Phoebe, except that it has orange red breast and uh, this, whereas the says Phoebe has a kind of a light brown um, appearance. And for the flycatchers that we see here, this is the most colorful because the others don't have the red. So this photo, uh, the second afternoon, uh, September 22nd, a day after the bird was uh, identified and seen, I went out there to look for it again. And uh, this is a picture of the bird. Uh, and uh, those of you who are struggling to see where the bird is, uh, here's the arrow that will tell you where the bird is. So it's, helpful. It's perched on top of the snag part, the dead part of this uh, tree. I uh, enjoyed watching the bird and the, the typical behavior of a flycatcher is that it will stay on the perch look for insects, fly from the perch, grab the insect and come back to the perch. So you can see this repetitive uh, behavior of capturing prey, eating it, come back to the perch and go for the next uh, uh, insect. And I was patiently sitting there and the bird uh, uh, came flying at me. And you can see here it is, he's looking at me as it fly, flew towards me. And the fly pattern is wing flap and then it glides. So it, with the wing flap, it rises, it glides, it comes down, it flaps its wing again and it flies that way. And then it came back with this moth in its beak. 
and then it came back to the original perch and uh, took its time to ingest this. And finally, we see this uh, returning of the flycatcher back to the perch. And these photographs really uh, shows the beauty of a, a bird coming into the perch. Yeah, it's putting on quite a show for you. Yes. So I have just two final questions for you, George. Okay. Of all these rare and elusive sightings, which do you think was the most exciting in recent memory, caused the most stir? I, I think the uh, Groove built Ani created uh, the most excitement and probably drew the uh, greatest number of birders uh, from uh, a wide, wide area because of the uh, rarity of the bird. Yeah, I'd spoken to a woman who had driven from quite far away just to yes. see the bird. Yes. Okay, and then my other question is, why do you think you like birding so much and why Bluff Lake in particular? Well, I'll answer the second part of the question first. Bluff Lake is within walking distance to my home. So it's it's literally, it's like my second home or my backyard. Uh, it is uh, convenient. Uh, it is a uh, beautifully situ situated and maintained uh, nature center. So it makes uh, it easy for me. Um, and uh, as far as uh, uh, birding as a hobby, uh, birding is no different uh, than shopping. Uh, it's a quest where people uh, seek after certain things and uh, are rewarded when you uh, achieve uh, buy the product or see the bird. Uh, my recommendation to birders is to not have expectations of which birds you will see, how many you will see, but to go out there free of any specific expectations, enjoy nature and let nature surprise you. Because when you make a turn and uh, a common bird like the robin uh, stares you at the face or a rare bird like the groove-billed ani looking at you. The excitement of having something like that in front of you to enjoy uh, is what I think birding is all about. Great, George. Well, thank you so much. We really appreciate you being here with us today. And to everyone watching, we hope We'll see more of you soon coming to visit our site and to get involved with the birding. Yes, thank you for giving me this opportunity to make this presentation. I enjoyed it. Great, thank you. Bye, everybody.